Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. There are some guests who really don't need an introduction, and one of those is Tukar Suleiman. Star of the BBC jewel in the Crown Dragon's Den and himself a hugely successful entrepreneur, Tukar sits in judgment of the business ideas of others with flashes of kindness and amusement and blinding business wisdom. St. George famously slew the dragon, but I neither would nor could seek to slay Suleiman the Magnificent Tukar. I'm just glad that he's here and that I'm here to talk to him. Tukar, thanks very much for joining us. Let me pitch an idea to you. Whoa. Britain is a member of a 500 million single market called the European Union. I have an idea that we might leave it. What would you say to that as an idea? The idea in principle is great for the British people. But I think, you know, there's an expression, there's no pain without gain. So we're now going to enter that pain period uh, in, in the UK. And uh, I think a lot of the um, British people were misled in what it really meant. Both ways, really, don't you think? Yes, both ways. You know, I think there are winners and there are losers w w within the British people. Tell us about the winners. What parts of the British economy can gain okay. from going it alone? Well, look, the biggest impact that we've seen with the forthcoming Brexit is the pound. The pound is devalued against the dollar approximately 20 odd percent. Mm. Uh, so those companies that are manufacturing, producing in this country, their exports will become much cheaper and hopefully their exports will grow. In theory, that's what should happen and there should be import substitution instead of buying things from uh, abroad. People should start making them here now and will buy them here. Well, funny thing is, um, we used to buy, for one of my businesses called Hawes and Curtis, we used to buy packaging from the Far East and an English company came to me last week and he pitched <laughs> for the business. <laughs> and do you know something? You got it. It was cheaper. You got it. It was, it was cheaper. cheaper. Yeah. Because by the time you pay the increase in the dollar and the duty and the transportation, it was very competitive. So I think we His plant was here. His plant was in Cambridge, a big packaging company, and they're now supplying everybody in the UK. Yes. Let me, uh, as it were, then pitch another uh, <laughs> idea uh, at you. Should we go for the full Monte on the principle that we can take advantage of a boom in homegrown industries, a boom in exports, and a fall in the labor supply? Because if we go for the full Monte, there'll be no free movement of labor, mm -hmm. and more and more British people will be able to enter the labor market. We've seen a boom in the UK the last 10 years, and that's because we've had a big influx of good labor. I mean, we talk about good labor, the Polish people. Fantastic labor. Great workers, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Indian people, the, the, the people that bring, add value. They've also kept down inflation because they've done jobs which nobody else will do. So, so, so in a way, I, I would say this, I would say we shouldn't close our doors to professional hard-working people but we should differentiate between what what i would call people that come here to abuse our national health service as social services but that's the tory government you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> look whatever government whatever government you know it is what's right for this country and to me um that, that there's Good things, bad things. I mean, the one thing we haven't spoken about is the effect on goods 
that are going to arrive in this country from outside. So the next time you go and buy a phone, whether it's an iPhone or whatever, you'll pay £60, £70 more. The next time you buy a piece of clothing... Because of the currency fluctuation. Because of the currency fluctuation. All the clothing you see, and we've seen clothing in the last 30 years mm. go down in price. Mm. We're about to see the first inflation in clothing in 30 years. Yes. Clothing will go up anywhere between 8 and 12%. Then again, we can get into the clothing business then ourselves. Some of these, <laughs> some of these sweatshops in the East End might have to reopen. Let me pitch another idea right. at you. I'm a knight of the realm. I own one of the most historic pieces of British retail uh, uh, architecture. It has three initials. Right, uh, I know exactly where you've been. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking of selling it to a guy I met on the corner. And he's going to look after everything, including the pensions uh, uh, liabilities of the company. Right. Should I sell it to him for a pound or not? <laughs> look, um, I think all I can tell you is the person in question made a mistake. And the fact is that if he couldn't turn that business around, nobody could. So when he sold that business, he was already bankrupt. Yeah, that has to be the case. That has to be the case. He should have closed it himself yes. and honoured the uh, commitments. Well, I, I, I cannot speak for himself, but I think the fact really is is that he's a very good retailer. Um, he's, a, he's a shrewd businessman. And he should have put his hand up and say, I made a mistake, guys. This hasn't worked. You know? And I, I think it was the, what I call the boomerang sale. Yeah. He sold it, it came back to haunt him. Yeah, yeah, and, and may, may, may yet uh, further. How did you get into television? You're a very <laughs> successful uh, entrepreneur, and you've, yeah. you've, you've performed a miracle, really, of being both a successful entrepreneur and a very, very engaging and popular television figure. How does that work? I'm, well, I'm uh, asking because uh, okay. I'm maybe coming out of my own business <laughs> now. <laughs> well, well, one thing's for sure, I'm not a celebrity, I'm an entrepreneur. So that, that's the first thing. But, but it was surely the fact that um, a good friend of mine called James Henderson from Bell Pottinger, and he was approached, does he know anybody who, who could be a dragon? So I went up for a, an interview, and they said, we'll come back to you. And then they came back to me and said, can you go to Manchester to meet the, the producer? I thought, Manchester? On the train? <laughs> anyway, so when I got there, sat down for lunch, <laughs> and within five minutes, he said, I, I want you. And I thought, mm -hmm. said, I want you my show. It took five minutes. Wow. Amazing. She is your biggest <laughs> fan, and the show's biggest fan. When I came home and told her that we'd met in another right. television studio, she was, her knees were Because, enough, I, enough yeah, that was together. the one time that I didn't go with him. The one time. <laughs> <laughs> but here you are now. Yeah. The show is phenomenally successful, even though no one can really identify with the... I mean, there, there must be billions of pounds worth of value sitting on that panel. Uh, you, you and your fellow dragons mm. have at least made, if not still got, billions. And not many of us come up with great ideas uh, that we could dream of pitching to you. You have millions of people uh, watch it. A uh, kind of escapism or what? Look, I think it is an escapism. It, it's, it's, it's a realistic show. All of us, deep inside, have this entrepreneurial urge. And, and I always say this, you know, you, you know, if you don't knock on the door, they won't open it for you. Yeah, but they have to do it on the public door. It's That's fine. the thing. But, but look, there are some genuine people who come on the show who've got genuine ideas, who just want that help taken to another level. There are the others who come on the show just for the PR. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So you know, there are situations where you think you've made an investment and then afterwards they change their minds. Oh, really? Oh, because the, they've right. had the PR. See, I've I was going to ask you that last question, unfortunately. Uh, what happens afterwards? How many of the successful bids that you've made to back, or offers rather, mm. to, to back somebody, how many of them have gone on to be profitable businesses? Well, it's a bit early yet. Yeah. You know, I've got, so for instance, I've, I invested last year in timber kits. Timber kits have, have now increased their turnover, 
started to make a profit, but they're not quite there yet. The journey's not there. I invested in something called Liquor Proof. They've doubled their turnover. Um, so it takes about two or three years. Mm. You know, we, we're not you know, wizard, but you, you may imagine one, one, one out one. it comes. Um, but I'll give you another example. Outside the den, a girl came to me with so-called matchstick monkey. It's a teething brush for babies. That alone would be a multi-million pound business. That's a great idea. Because, we, because it's a teething brush that's got scope to do other products, books, animated cartoons. Complete merchandise. Merchandise. We've even got Mike Chapman, the famous Mike Chapman songwriter, mm -hmm. writing us a jingle. Wow. And that's outside the den. So it's not only in the uh, den. Yeah, I mean, I knew, when I, because I was late, I knew that my wife would tell you that she's got a vintage clothes <laughs> I already shop, pitched to him, yes. And she would ask <laughs> advice from you that you would, that would otherwise be worth a lot of money uh, yes. and time. Uh, is, does that happen to you all the time? All the time, especially ta taxi drivers. No. Put them in the back yeah. of the taxi. They've always got. They've, a, always got, say, they've got. They're a driver and they've got a small business on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to your wonderful wife, <laughs> beautiful wife, I say, is that she did ask me, and I think I gave her a few. As he did definitely. I, 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 gave, her, I, I gave her some tuka time. <laughs> uh, see, that's not cheap tuka time. Um, ha have you, as it were, profited, profited, or lost? from becoming also involved in television? Look, I, I don't do it for the profit. I think in most cases, I love to help people. Yeah, I knew that. Uh, yeah. I, I love to help. Like this morning, somebody came to me, got a little problem. I helped them just over the moon. And the problem I've got is time. How much time? Because everybody wants your time. You know, and, and it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I get direct messages and some I try to answer back and it's difficult. I should really um, create a day when everybody can queue up and come to me for 10 minutes. Like Suleiman the Magnificent. Yes. You yes. could have a majlis <laughs> yes. and the people could queue up and yeah. you could see as many as you were able to <laughs> see that day. And if not, next week, Tukar, you are a real star. And it's a pleasure. And a Thank you. It's been a pleasure you for me. Here Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. Coming up next, have the walls of racism come tumbling down before the trumpets of rock and roll, we meet a man with the answers after. Welcome back to Sputnik. Rock Against Racism was born in the 1970s out of the struggle against the National Front. If you don't know who they are, you will by the end of this interview. And other far-right extremists, as well as to stand up to what its founders perceived was a wider racist malaise in the rock scene. Uniting pop, rock, punk and reggae artists, the campaign has gone down in history of British anti-fascism and protest music. Who better to talk us through its legacy than Daniel Rachel, author of Walls Come Tumbling Down, the music and politics of rock against racism, two-tone and red wedge. Daniel, thanks for joining us. This book is the soundtrack of my Life, I became a political activist, as it happens, in the early 1970s, just before the first rise of the National Front. I moved to London in 83, got involved in many of these movements. So I, and I think a lot of people, are going to want to get this book. Tell us why you wrote it and why you were the best person to write it. <laughs> well, I was living in Birmingham in the mid-80s, and I went to see Billy Bragg, uh, for the first time on the Jobs for Industry tour. Mm. And I went expecting to pogo down the front to Billy and his electric guitar and the, the cleansing rock of, the cleansing fire of punk rock, as he calls it. But when I stepped into the auditorium at the Birmingham Powerhouse, Claire Short was there. I wasn't certain who Claire Short was, but I knew she was an MP. And so, so there was a connection made between politics and going in to see a musician. And out of that came the idea of Red Wedge a year later. And as a, a person in my mid-teens, it was music and politics were being brought together by an artist I like, and it set me on, on a, um, a road, I guess, of exploration of culture, politics. This fusion of uh, music, art, culture, politics, of course, uh, had happened before. Uh, we're uh, 
in the anniversary coming up to the uh, to the Bolshevik Revolution, there was a lot of uh, such fusion then. But in Britain, it hadn't actually happened before. No. Uh, and your book uh, chronicles how it happened, and also why it happened. And for younger viewers, whilst Britain has no far right problem today in an organized sense, at least as compared to some other European countries. There are plenty of racists around, of course, but, but there's not a big and powerful fascist movement and organizations in Britain now. But in the 70s and 80s, there was first the National Front, which as far-right groups do, imploded and morphed, became the BNP. These were organizations with thousands of members who marched and intimidated and threatened people. And so the artistic community rising up to meet it was a really significant political thing, wasn't it? Well, the significance was that the, the, the talk of far-right politics was very much within pop music and rock music. Rod Stewart had made comments about immigration in the early 70s. David Bowie was talking about the idea of Adolf Hitler being the first rock and roll superstar. Uh, Eric Clapton then, in 1976, at a gig in Birmingham, made outrageous racist comments continually throughout the evening, calling for non-white people to get out of the country. And that gig was reviewed in the music papers and got an immediate response by an activist called Red Saunders. And the, he wrote a letter that was printed in all the music papers and right at the end he said, we need a rank and file movement against the racist poison in rock music. And there was a P.O. Box address at the end of this letter. And within weeks, hundreds and hundreds of handwritten letters came to what ostensibly became Rock Against Racism. And out of that, a grassroots movement that originated in London spread nationally. Um, groups popped up all over the country that led to carnivals, uh, mass carnivals, where tens and tens of thousands of people came. And the important thing was that it was white people saying that racism is our problem and we need to speak out against it and crush it. Because, as you rightly say, the National Front were scoring incredibly high in local elections around the country. They were threatening at the next general election, which turned out to be, as you know, 1979, to put a candidate in every constituency. The, the need to crush fascism or neo-fascism was immense, and, and the answer came culturally, which was very, very exciting. Um, so that the, the, and the core principle of Rock Against Racism was very, very simple. It was, let's put on a white band, let's put on a black band on the same bill, and at the end, they ha both have to come on stage and jam together. So the vision of the audience is black and white, united on stage, which Jerry Dammers, who would go on to form Two-Tone, and form the specials in the image of Rock Against Racism, i.e. black and white members. He took that a step further and said, let's have a band with black and white members. And suddenly you have the two-tone movement ex in ex exploding across the nation, where singles, when every single one of the first ten two-tone records went into the top ten, they were selling hundreds of thousands of records. The high streets were full of people wearing black and white clothing. And suddenly racism was being flipped from this idea of the rock gods to, to core working class audiences who were equally being uh, lured by the National Front. And, and, and they were being told, you can go that way, or you can go this way, which is the way of the angels, is how it's described by Robert Elms in the book. The way of the great records, the way of the musicians, the way that the majority of the audience are dancing and enjoying music and politically saying there has to be a social and there has to be a political change in our country. Well, if your writing is as good as your talking, <laughs> I'm going to uh, start reading this book uh, this evening. Um, there was an organized left-wing political core to the movement. Uh, Far-left parties, like the SWP, for example, were involved. I, I, I think it's to their credit that they, and I'm no fan of theirs, uh, that they knew 
and organized on the principle that they knew that this had to be much wider and bigger than them. How wide and big did it get? It was absolutely enormous, and, and the, the crucial intervention was in a year after the formation of Rock Against Racism was the formation of the Anti-Nazi League with people like Peter Hayne I was and, in it. <clears throat> and, I was and, in and Neil yeah. Kinnock at the, at the helm. Mm, and you'll mm. know from being in Scotland that that's the, the mobilisation that Rock Against Racism needed culturally could be brought to a mass audience because of their ability to to feed out across the whole of the United Kingdom. So you, you had the music first, you had exciting concerts, and before these events, you then had political engagement. And it's a lesson that Red Wedge, which is the last third of the story, very much uh, learnt from, where you would have a Red Wedge concert in the evening, but in the daytime, they would fill church halls, youth clubs, and with disenfranchised youth, and they would m bring them to meet the pop stars of the day, number one artists of the day, but also to bring in the local politician and to bring in a national politician. And Red Wedge said to the politicians in the Labour Party, your job is simply to listen. You, you, I want them, they, they, they were there to listen to the grievances of people that felt they didn't have a voice and therefore didn't want to register on the electoral roll and therefore didn't even want to vote and decide their own future. Where did it all go wrong? Exactly. <laughs> uh, this was a golden era and especially listening to you talk, looking back on it, thinking back on it, a real golden era when Unimaginable, almost were at their now. best. Now, we don't have fascist organizations of any size, not just the National Front, but the BNP are also history. The EDL can't fill two or three coaches to go and kick people in uh, various northern towns. Uh, but there is mass racism in the country. Again, not as bad as it is in some other countries, but still very bad. And most of these cultural icons have kind of faded from the scene. Some even changed sides to some extent. Um, when's the, where's the next wave coming from of resistance to racism? That's an incredibly pertinent question. And of course, when pop music involves itself with politics, pop music invariably only has a very limited lifespan. You know, you're lucky if a band last two, three years. You know, the Beatles' recorded lifespan is, is barely seven years. So for these artists, they took, they seized their moment and incredibly seized the moment where they were becoming famous for the first time in their lives. So where you could just enjoy the, 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 the you know, the, the, the rewards of success, they chose to align themselves politically and take the journey as a, as a, hand, a dual handed uh, initiative, if you like. So that takes a lot of courage. Um, but that was then. That was the 70s, that was the 80s. It was a different social political time. Now we live in a new age. And I, I, I'm not one for saying that movements should be replicated. I think history and reading perhaps books like this can teach us what works and what doesn't work and what youth movements want, where they come from and why people are inspired to be part of them. But really, they have to come from the grassroots. And I think in many ways, the grime movement has been doing that for at least 10 years. But, there, but do we know about grime in a national way? Perhaps not. And why is that? Then we, we could then look at media and, and how does media control um, the outlets of underground resistance groups? So therefore, if it's been pushed out of the mainstream, maybe therefore it's online. And, and online offers incredible uh, opportunities for mass resistance. Indeed it and does. I think perhaps that's where the answers will Daniel come from. Daniel Rachel, the very best of luck with this book. You deserve every success. Thanks for joining us on the Sputnik. <laughs> and now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So we first asked uh, the audience um, how they would like to see Britain post-Brexit. And Janice Carr answers, Crikey, there's so much securing human rights, employment, environmental protection, 
encouraging fair trade with third world. And Agathocles says, as Mr. Galloway has said, let the pound fall and encourage import substitution. And in regards to music uh, combined with politics, um, Echo Marley says, reggae and Bruce Lee films. Music is my art of fighting without fighting. I disrupt the corrupt. I turn music into food. Good for you, <laughs> Mr. Marley. That's all uh, we've got time for. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on social media, Twitter, RT underscore Sputnik, or Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. <laughs> it's been marvellous.